Around the turn of the 20th century, so far as I understand it, the Aristotelian view still prevailed, and that is that the universe was eternal. And people believed, essentially, that it was static. They didn't think the stars moved very much. They weren't aware of other galaxies other than the Milky Way. So it was essentially an eternal static universe. And that was, of course, about to be changed. The Big Bang does not disprove the need for God or Creator. That's a confusion of thought. The Big Bang is simply telling us we believe there was a beginning. That is what Genesis has been saying for thousands of years. The point is Genesis is not only telling us that there was a beginning, it is also telling us what science cannot tell us, the ultimate cause of that beginning, which is God. So a Christian has nothing to fear from people using the words Big Bang, although, as I said earlier, uh, they are misleading. They're, you think of an explosion that makes a noise, which is very far from the basic idea. But let's grasp the central thing, which I find is marvelous. Because, as I've often said to physicists, look, it took you till the 1960s to come to believe that the universe had a beginning. I actually believed it myself before you did because I have reasons for thinking that the biblical revelation is true. And what is more, if you had taken seriously the worldview of the Bible and weren't so committed to Aristotle, you might have looked for evidence for a beginning to space-time much earlier than you did. Now, this is very important because many scientists say, well, the Bible makes no predictions. Well, that's not quite true because if you take its worldview seriously here at the very start, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, if that's true, you can test it. And this is exactly what happened uh, through Lemaitre, Hubble and uh, Penzias and Wilson, they were testing something that the Bible had stated. And isn't it interesting, it was Georges Lemaitre, a priest, who first led them to the idea. There are many things I think will remain beyond our knowledge. Uh, we don't know from a scientific perspective what consciousness is. We don't really know what energy is. And the basic things in the universe, we find very difficult to know what they are. And some things may be unknowable. I'm perfectly happy with that. I, uh, God has encouraged us, I believe, in Genesis to find things out. The mandate for doing science occurs in the early chapters of the Bible where God told humans to name the animals. And that's taxonomy, which is the fundamental academic discipline. It applies to all disciplines, actually, naming things. And that's what we're trying to do with the early universe. But whether it can be done exhaustively is an open question. And I'm very happy with that. The universe has infinite potential for exploration. And of course, that keeps scientists in business. The idea of need is a very curious one. I'm interested in truth. Was there a creator or was there not a creator? Now, I know this is a popular view today because Hawking popularized it. There's no need for a creator. There's nothing for a creator to do. But I have analyzed his arguments very carefully. In fact, I've written a book about them called God and Stephen Hawking. And his method of getting rid of a creator, to my mind, does not work at all. Because what he does, and others do the same thing, like Lawrence Krauss of Arizona State University, they talk about the universe. Well, let me quote talking to you. He says, because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now, when I first read that, and that's the key statement in the book by 
Hawking and Mladenov the grand design. That's the key statement. I was staggered because it's self-contradictory to start with. Because there is a law of gravity, because there is something, the universe can create itself from nothing. That's a flat contradiction. And then to say the universe can create itself, that's logical nonsense. If I say that X creates Y, roughly speaking, I'm saying if you've got X, you, you may in the end get Y. But if I say X creates X, then that simply proves to me, sorry for being provocative, it simply proves to me that nonsense remains nonsense even if high-powered scientists say it. So that's the second thing that's wrong with that statement. It is logical nonsense. But then the idea of nothing is fascinating. In fact, I give lectures on nothing these days because nothing turns out to be very interesting. Because how they get a universe from nothing is by redefining nothing. It's very hard to believe this, but Lawrence Krauss in his book, A Universe from Nothing, tells us fairly early on, he says this, because something is physical, nothing much must be physical, especially if you define it as the absence of something. That is absolute foolish absurdity. Now, if you have to go to that extreme to get rid of God, you're not getting rid of God at all. You're not getting a universe from nothing. So you're failing spectacularly to solve the problem that Hawking and Christ set up for themselves at the beginning of their books. And that is Leibniz's question, why is there something rather than nothing? And that's why I am not impressed by these attempts to say we don't need God. I think you do, because the very interesting thing is many of these people getting a universe from nothing, which doesn't work because their nothing is actually something, a quantum vacuum or something like that, will say the laws of nature do it. Well, where do they come from? They don't answer that question. So it seems to me that before we start, you need a God to structure the universe in such a way that it's got laws. And one of my main reasons for being a believer in God, apart from my Christianity, of course, is that science can be done. And science can be done as Newton, Galileo, Kepler, Clark, Maxwell, Babbage, and all those pioneers believed, because there's an intelligent God behind the universe. And C.S. Lewis put it brilliantly when he said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law of nature because they believed in a legislator, a lawgiver. I often say to people, you know, modern science in a very real way is the gift of the Judeo-Christian worldview to humanity. And that's why I'm not ashamed of being a scientist and a Christian simultaneously, because arguably it was Christianity gave me my worldview. And so Newton and company, they started. Their belief in God did not hinder their science. It was the motor that drove it. And I think we need to get back to seeing that that is the real source of modern scientific research. I believe that science does point towards God. And one of the strongest evidences for that from astronomy and cosmology is the so-called fine-tuning of the universe. I remember having a discussion with a very well-known Oxford philosopher who's an atheist, and he had asked me to address his students on why I believed in God, and he said, I hope you're going to use the best argument against atheism from science. And I said, well, if you tell me what it is, I'll use it. And he said, if ever I was to be persuaded to become a believer, it would be because of fine tuning. Now the idea here is that over the past 50 to 100 years, it has been discovered that not only is this earth obviously a very special place in the sense that 
If we were further from our sun, life would not be possible because it would be too cold. If the earth were near to the sun, it would not be possible because we're too hot and many other things. But the fundamental constants of nature have turned out to be so accurately tuned in order to have life in the universe that the scientists themselves, whether they're atheists, Christians, or people of different worldviews, all think there's something here to be explained. Stephen Hawking, Lord Race, who's our astronomer royal, and so on. They all think there's something there. And that intrigues me, and I believe there is something there. Now, in order to get away from the idea of fine-tuning, it's so improbable that you have to have some mechanism for reducing, uh, for increasing the probabilities. And one of the ways of doing that is the multiverse. From a scientific perspective, I was taught quantum physics by Sir John Polkinghorne, and he makes the point that the multiverse, these universes, are not accessible to us, and that it's much more natural to believe, and much more sensible, I would say, to believe in a single universe created by a creator rather than a multiverse to which we've no access and where there's no evidence that it exists. Now, a great deal has been written about this, but I find it's a very interesting thing because you don't have to go against the main flow of science to use this as an argument. This is mainstream science admitting that the universe is fine-tuned. And there's increasing evidence that, in a sense, biology, organisms are fine-tuned. And that is another level entirely.